In this last lecture of this course, we will study the stability improvement uh, of a power system. In particular, uh, we will focus on uh, the possible instability which occurs in case of large disturbances. That is the relative angular instability which occurs uh, due to large, large disturbances which causes loss of synchronism between synchronous machines. Okay. So, uh, when I say improving stability, we shall look at measures in operation planning or design which can actually uh, allow us to operate the system more securely. That is for credible disturbances one can uh, you know the system is stable for credible large disturbances. Okay. So, uh, today's lecture is on stability improvement uh, for large disturbance stability. Okay. Now, uh, as you know uh, just to keep matters in uh, perspective angular instability is essentially consists of two phenomena loss of synchronism which is basically a large disturbance phenomena. It is also called transient instability. We also saw in the last lecture that uh, angular instability can also manifest in terms of small disturbances okay, and that is due to undamped oscillations or power swings okay. and uh, power swings could be uh, you know the damping of power swings could be improved by making changes in controller. Con controllers are augmenting or having auxiliary control controllers for controllable elements in a power in the power system like uh, the excitation system in a generator or HPDC power flow control. We can actually ensure that these swings are actually stable. We also saw uh, the phenomena of voltage stability in which uh, we could have a voltage collapse at certain buses due to lack of reactive power reserve because of for example, generators uh, hitting the field current limits a weak network and loads which try to draw the same amount of power in spite of uh, prevalent low voltage conditions. So, and a combination of these circumstances could in certain conditions cause a voltage collapse. In fact, if the loads maintain a constant power or or you know kind of maintain constant power by the use of tap changing transformers. One way to avoid voltage instability is to recognize such a situation is developing and disable uh, transformer traps. So, that your load is not aggressive load will fall if the voltage falls. Okay. So, this is one way you can improve voltage stability. We also saw uh, right in the uh, beginning of the last three lectures that uh, we can have uh, better frequency stability that is better load generation balance by using governors or emergency control in the form of under frequency relays or d f by d t that is rate of change of frequency relays. Okay. Remember uh, often uh, when we are talking of stability problems or any problems in a power system, we also will encounter the phenomena of line overloads transmission line overloads that is thermal heating overload. Okay. This is not really a stability problem, it is a quasi static problem in the sense that uh, heating could occur even if there is no stability problem. You can have uh, loading of transmission line above the thermal limits. Okay. In that case, you are actually having a steady state problem of heating. Okay. So, it is not exactly a stability problem, okay. but the main stability problems which we do face of course, are angular instability, voltage instability and frequency instability. Okay. Of course, if you design some of the feedback control systems in your, uh, you know, uh, in your controllers uh, incorrectly, you can actually cause some pattern or mode to go unstable. So this is something which also uh, which also can occur. Okay. Now uh, there's one uh, important thing when we are talking about angular or frequency instability. We have show, I've shown you this uh, kind of a crude analogy of a multi-machine system. You have two important uh, uh, things to worry about in a multi machine system. One is frequency instability or in other words the center of inertia motion of the system okay, which depends upon the sum of or rather the load generation cumulative load generation balance in the system. Okay. In addition you have got relative motion which you have to worry about that is uh, the problem of power swings and relative motion can also be large disturbance unstable and that is what we have called as transient instability. Okay. So, these are the mainly the phenomena associated with the electromechanical system. Okay. Of course, we have seen that power swings uh, can 
you know uh, be unstable small signal unstable or small disturbance unstable due to the effect of feedback controllers like high gain automatic voltage regulators in the system okay again let us just uh, try to understand it using these plots which i have shown you in previous lectures as well today's lecture actually is worried about large disturbance angular instability so we are really talking about the lower left hand system in which after a large disturbance the speeds of the generator deviate from one another and you may have a, a situation where there may be large fluctuations in voltage and power in the system. Okay. So, this of course, phenomena occurs in synchronous grids only where that is in grids in which synchronous machines are interconnected by AC lines. If machines lose synchronism that is they run at different speeds, you will have unacceptable variations in power voltage and so on. This can be of course, understood easily using this simple example which is shown, in, shown on the slide where you have got two, it is a kind of idealized scenario, you have got two uh, sources which are running at different frequencies and if you plot the three phase power, the total three phase power, you will find that if you have got two sources with different frequencies, the power flow through the transmission line will kind of oscillate at the difference frequency okay? and the power flow actually undergoes variations which may be, I mean the uh, power flow you can go even negative, I mean you can have both negative and positive variation. So, the variation is very, very significant. Okay. So, in case you have got a loss of synchronism scenario, where you have got two uh, you know synchronous machines running at different frequencies while still being connected by an AC line, this is unacceptable and uh, typically it leads to voltage at some part of the grid, you know under uh, it makes the voltage undergo very large variations. In fact, if you look at the this lower graph here, it shows the instantaneous voltage in the midpoint of the system and you see that in case the two systems lose synchronism, that is they operate at two different frequencies, then your voltage at the midpoint, the envelope of the AC voltages even touches 0 at certain points. Okay? So, this is of course, unacceptable and usually if you have got distance relays, okay, they mistake this variation in voltage. Uh, in fact, the voltage at some point becomes 0. So, they think it is a fault okay? and if that happens, they trip trip the line. So, the system actually uh, separates out. Okay? In fact, uh, you effectively have an uncontrolled system separation in case distance relays trip after the loss of synchronism. Okay? In fact, if two machines are going out of synchronism due to a large disturbance, okay? this is a large disturbance phenomena. In that case, you have to separate out the two systems. In fact, for the western uh, grid of our country, it was seen that typically whenever you had a loss of synchronism, you would have the western part and the eastern part of the system splitting. Okay? So, this is a typical cut set which is seen. Okay? You have got the eastern part and the western part of the system splitting and uh, thereafter of course, you have got two islands which are formed in the system okay? or two separate synchronous grids which are formed in the system. So, this kind of uh, uncontrolled system separation can occur following loss of synchronism. Okay. This is uh, not uh, although it uh, the whole course has been uh, kind of theoretical in the sense of uh, telling you the theory modeling and there, thereafter drawing inferences about the dynamic behavior. Uh, I am not really shown you a loss of synchronism uh, after uh, following a large disturbance, we did see right in the first lecture a situation where if we went on increasing the power output of a synchronous machine, which is connected to a voltage source, you come to a point where it loses synchronism, but loss of synchronism can also occur after a large disturbance and what you see here of course, is one such practical situation which did occur in our western grid several years ago. And, uh, if you look at these graphs, the first graph is the voltage in the A phase, then the current in the A phase, then the voltage in the B phase, the current in the B phase, voltage in the C phase and the current in the B C phase. So, what you notice very clearly is the signature of loss of synchronism. This is a voltage which is measured at some uh, uh, at a location in the grid after 
the loss of synchronism. You see this typical signature where the voltage dips down to 0 and again rises. Okay. This is a scenario, this is a typical signature uh, which is seen, this is in fact over a 400 kV line in the system. So, this is a real life example of a loss of synchronism. Okay. In fact, uh, this idealized scenario which we saw using a two machine example is something what has happened in a bigger scale in the in a real grade where the groups of machines in the east part of the system have lost synchronism uh, with the machines in the west part of the system. And this particular in fact measurement was taken for a real life event, real life response after a large disturbance and what was really being measured was the voltage on this particular line. Okay. And this is what was really seen at one bus in the system. Okay. So, this is a typical signature of a loss of synchronism, it really occurs, okay. it really does happen in a real grid okay. after a large disturbance. Of course, uh, the loss of synchronism uh, events occurring in grids happen very rarely. In fact, uh, I have to really dig out uh, you know various disturbance records and you know consult my colleagues in the industry to get this particular situation where system actually did lose synchronism. It does not normally lose synchronism because you operate it or design it or plan it in such a way. Okay. So, normally you loss of synchronism events are not seen. Now, we will just discuss what really I mean by this, but before that let us just summarize uh, what we have learned or what, uh, what are the main aspects of angular instability. One of the aspects of angular instability is the stability after small disturbances, which can be actually analyzed by linearized uh, you know eigen analysis of the system. Okay. Uh, this is what we did in fact in uh, you know in the previous uh, lecture we just discussed what happens uh, for small disturbances, how we can improve the small disturbance stability by improving the control systems or augmenting them with auxiliary controllers. Okay. Now, Remember that small disturbances relates to the relative angular oscillatory behavior okay? and it is a property of the equilibrium in the sense that uh, any disturbance small or large can excite these uh, oscillations and under certain uh, situations these may be unstable. But having power swings is not actually a problem as long as the oscillations die out. In fact, any disturbances lead to uh, you know these uh, typical you know oscillations which you will see in the responses of the generator speed. Okay. But these are not problem, there is not a problem if the oscillations die out. We really are facing a small disturbance problem only if these oscillations die, do not die out. I mean the you have got sustained oscillations or growing oscillations. Okay. This is something which may be of uh, which may be a real worry. Large disturbance instability on the other hand which is also called transient instability is disturbance dependent, it depends on the magnitude of the disturbance. Okay. And one important point which is uh, which has to be appreciated that in any synchronous grid that is a grid in which you have got large number of synchronous machines connected by uh, transmission lines, transient instability will always be an issue in the sense that you never get rid of this problem in the true sense you will always uh, find in a synchronous grid a large enough disturbance which leads to instability. Now, the key problem is for a credible disturbance, a credible I mean a disturbance which seems realistic, does the system remain stable or not. So, when I say large disturbance stable, it is of course, disturbance dependent on the magnitude of the disturbance. For typical or credible magnitude of disturbances is the system stable or not would be a more engineering like question. Okay. But remember that the large disturbance stability phenomena as such will always be there okay, in a, a system uh, a power system. Remember when I say large disturbance instability it also means that this arises due to the nonlinear nature of a power system. Okay. Otherwise small disturbance stability and large disturbance stability would be equivalent. In a linear system there is no such distinction, but in a nonlinear system large disturbance behavior may be significantly different from small disturbance behavior. So, for small disturbances the system may be stable, the oscillations may be dying out, but for large disturbances you can always cook up a large enough disturbance in a synchronous grid which will make your system unstable. Okay. So, this is what I mean by uh, the large disturbance instability being disturbance dependent, but it always being an issue in a synchronous grid. 
So, just to look at just to re emphasize what I am trying to say transient stability uh, if you look at this particular figure suppose you have got a multi machine system. Okay. Transient instability in a two machine system was in fact simulated if you look at the lecture uh, number 38 or 39 you will find that uh, we have actually simulated a two machine system in which you can have transient instability following a fault. So, let us just see a typical situation another typical situation where you could have transient instability. So, you have got a system in which uh, there are four generators each of them say generating 1000 megawatt and uh, you know uh, you have got two loads or two load buses in which loads are actually uh, you know uh, accumulated that is 1000 megawatt and 3000 megawatt they are here at this bus and at this bus. Okay. And uh, since there is of course, load generation balance is generating 4000 megawatts there is a load of 4000 megawatts. So, center of inertia frequency will be stable, but uh, here of course, we are assuming no losses are there. The total load generation is balanced, but you need to transfer uh, 1000 megawatts from this system to that system. Okay, because there is more load here than the generation here. Now, suppose this is a typical situation you know there is a fault on one of these transmission lines. Now, if there is a fault on one of these transmission lines typically if your protection system is well designed and is operating well it will be detected quite soon enough and uh, there will be circuit breakers will be opened at both ends of this transmission line and this fault gets cleared. Okay, or de energized. Now, once you trip open these lines, uh, this particular line on which is faulted, you have to the load generation scenario of course, has not changed in the meantime. So, what you will have effectively is that the power which is flowing through two lines will have to now flow through one line. And uh, what would be a steady state scenario? Okay would be this that 1000 megawatts flows through the remaining line, but the key issue here is this is the steady state scenario because the system is undergone a fault and a line tripping thereafter some transients will be uh, uh, you know created and the basic point is that uh, the system moves from one equilibrium to another okay? or rather there is a fault and the system deviates substantially from the original equilibrium. The equilibrium itself changes now the question is whether the system will settle down to this new equilibrium. So, this is the equilibrium condition uh, after a large disturbance, but the point is that you may either be stable and the power flow may go from the remaining uh, in the remaining line from 500 megawatts to 1000 megawatts. So, the transient in this particular line earlier the power was 500 megawatts now it is 1000 megawatts under steady state the question is that you will of course have a transient initially 500 megawatts was flowing through the line then there was a fault so the power dips because the voltage would dip in the system the power flow dips in the line then the fault is cleared by tripping the line and the system tries to go to this new equilibrium and this is the response if the system is stable. So, you would say that the system is large disturbance stable for this particular disturbance. Okay. And if you look at the generator speeds, you will find that the generator speeds also the relative motion stabilizes after some time. Okay. That is the speeds of all generators remains in synchronism. What would happen if the system was not stable? This is what would happen. You would find that the generators speeds would deviate from each other one set would accelerate one set would decelerate and if you look at the power transients in the transmission line you will find these very large variations okay what we had discussed some time back the power will start pulsating at a very uh, with a very large magnitude okay and uh, this is an unstable situation this is a large disturbance unstable situation okay so of course if you are unstable there is nothing you can do you have to disconnect the two systems. Remember the system are still connected. So, you need to disconnect the two systems otherwise the transient variations can be large enough to damage equipment. Okay. So, once you have tripped out or separated out the two systems you have formed two islands and uh, you have the island one has more generation, 
but less load. But island 2 has less generation and more load. So, there will be a dual problem which you need to solve that is whether the system after you know the system uh, islanding has taken place whether the individual two individual islands uh, whether the center of uh, center of inertia frequency within those islands is going to stabilize or not. Okay? So, we get a frequency stability problem after islanding has occurred. Of course, the frequency can stabilize provided you have got mechanisms to ensure this load generation balance. That is you have governing systems or under frequency load shedding schemes which ensure that there is generation load balance. For example, in island 2 you would need to do quick load shedding in order to ensure that the island is stable. Okay? Otherwise, you will in no time the frequency will drop down to such an extent in island 2 that you will have to trip out the steam turbine uh, uh, turbines and therefore, you will have a complete blackout in that region. Okay? So, you need to take quick actions after this if the system is unstable. Okay? So, how do we improve transient stability or large disturbance stability? Unlike uh, uh, you know the problem which we discussed in the previous class, this is a large disturbance instability problem. In fact, uh, by tweaking controls a little bit you know or having auxiliary controllers which modulate uh, you know some voltage reference say of an automatic voltage regulator etcetera you may not be able to get uh, you know improve upon this transient stability okay of course you can make large changes in controllers you can have controllers you know kind of uh, you can make controllers act in such a way that they actually improve uh, transient stability as well what do you mean by improving transient stability for a given credible disturbance if the system is unstable you make changes in the system so that the system becomes stable okay so of course when i say imp, uh, how do you improve transient stability it can mean three things how do you improve transient stability in a system during planning so what do you do when you plan a system so that uh, your system is uh, transient stable See, a planner knows that transient stability is always going to be an issue in a synchronous grid. So, when the system is being planned, say for uh, you know, uh, you know, if you are doing short term or long term, let's say talk about long term planning, you are sure that uh, you know some new generation is going to come up, some new load loads are going to come up, and uh, you know you are going to have uh, power different kind of power flow scenarios in the system. A system planner, what he does is he kind of predicts or forecasts the kind of load and generation scenario, and uh, he carries out what is known as transient stability studies. What are transient stability studies? They are essentially simulation studies uh, on how the system behaves following credible disturbances. So there are a set of disturbances or contingencies with which a planner will consider, like uh, loss of a major generating plant or a fault. Um, you know uh, a three phase fault at a particular bus which is cleared by primary protection or a single line to ground fault at certain important buses which is cleared not by the primary protection but by the backup protection okay or the loss of an hvdc uh, uh, pole okay so these kind of scenarios are worst uh, you know kind of worst case but, but credible scenarios you know they should not be incredible scenarios okay what do you mean by incredible scenarios you should not consider scenarios of disturbance scenarios which are very very unlikely to occur okay but uh, the loss of a transmission line following a fault is a very common occurrence you know in a given day you may find that you know at least 3 or 4 such events may take place in a large synchronous grid like in india okay so if you look at the disturbance reports which are uh, you know put out by uh, many of these utilities you will find that they have given uh, you will find very uh, not not uh, infrequently there will be faults you know single line to ground faults and so on which result in transmission line tripping and so on these are large disturbances because when you have a fault for some duration the voltages everywhere come uh, voltages go down there may be sudden changes so you can consider a fault as a very large disturbance okay so these things continually occur so for uh, a credible disturbance is something which we which we think uh, has got some reasonable probability that will occur. Okay, so a planner system planner will try out many 
probable such probable contingencies and ensure that the system is stable even under stress conditions that is unusual load and generation patterns okay again credible patterns in which certain lines are loaded more or less okay so this kind of exercise is done in planning now sometimes you may a planner may find that for credible disturbances which he may simulate using a transient stability program that the system is not stable in such a situation he will think of augmenting the transmission system okay so he may think of for example uh, you know building a new transmission line he may in fact think of that okay that is a way of going forward now uh, how does you know of course i i i have told you that you know whenever a system is not transiently stable i mean is not uh, stable for la credible large disturbances one of the ways of improving stability is to strengthen the transmission system what what is the basis of saying that okay now if you look at uh, to understand that we'll consider a simple single machine connected to an infinite bus through a say a reactance x this is a representation of a transmission line you know that the power flow for an idealized or very simple model of a generator as a voltage source behind a reactance okay the power flow versus delta that is the phase angular difference between this generator this you know which is a representative of in some ways of the rotor position and this infinite bus okay is given by this power angle characteristic okay that is e e b sin delta by x plus x dash this is of course the simplest model assuming that the generator is represented by classical model okay a transmission line by simple x network transients stator transients everything is neglected in that case you come to this power angle characteristic and if you recall what you have done in your undergraduate years if you have got a system which has got say two transmission lines x and x in that case the power angle characteristically e b e b sin delta divided by x by 2 plus x dash because there are two transmission lines in parallel now if there is a fault here this is a typical kind of uh, study which we did when we were undergraduates and studying power systems you give a fault on one of the transmission lines at one end okay the fault is detected and then cleared out okay so this is a typical fault or large disturbance scenario which we considered while trying to study transient stability so under normal operating conditions we will be having this equilibrium condition here if there is a fault the elect this is of course the mechanical power the intersection of the electrical power and the mechanical power defines the operating delta okay now if there is a fault electrical power suddenly becomes equal to zero so the machine accelerates okay then the fault is cleared and you are have you are now left with only one transmission line because this trans faulted transmission line is tripped out so your post fault power angle characteristic will be like this it will be somewhere lower like this okay and uh, one of the things we studied in our undergraduate years when we uh, when we when we were attacking this problem was for such a scenario and for such simple single machine infinite bus system with a very simplified generator model one could show that if at the point of fault clearing your rotor angle had deviated due to the disturbance to this point delta then the system is stable if this area is more than this area okay so the system is stable if this area is more than this area this was called equal area criterion okay so uh, although in this particular course in some sense we never used this criterion the emphasis of this course was uh, you know trying to model a synchronous machine in more realistic kind of detail so we did not use such simple models to uh, show loss of synchrony in fact we did a two machine system simulation in which we gave a fault and then we showed that uh, for a large enough fault the system is unstable we did not actually use equal area criterion to show that the system is unstable 
we did a simulation okay for large very large system to get quantitatively accurate results simulation may be the only way which you can assess stability okay uh, quantitatively accurately that's what i mean but uh, from a conceptual or a roughly you know if you want to get a rough or approximate answer then one may use equal area criteria like analytical tools for simplified system models and get approximate uh, you can approximately assess transient instability as done in this example. So, if you got a single machine infinite bus for this fault and a very simplified model, the equal area criterion which is derived uh, not in this course, but in the first course of power systems tells that this area if it is greater than this area then the system is stable and this can be said without simulating the system, because this is a very simple system. Okay. Now, this equal area criterion although we have not used for getting quantitatively accurate results, it can easily tell you what needs to be done in case you want to improve stability. So, we will use equal area criterion not to get exact quantitative results, but to suggest what can be done to improve stability. So, let us just talk of the planning option. Okay. A planning option says is strengthen the transmission system. What do I mean by that? Suppose, my system had 3 lines instead of 2. In that case, the power angle curve is enhanced, because now you have got P is equal to electrical power is given by E E B sin delta x by 3 plus x dash. So, this is really got enhanced. Okay, This is electrical power versus delta. So, for the same power flow, if I give the same disturbance, it is more likely that if there is of course, one line trip after a fault, an equal area criterion would say after one line trip, this becomes P e is equal to E e b sin delta by x by 2 plus x dash. So, now what you have got is a much more enhanced area, because this is slightly enhanced okay, compared to the earlier case. Okay. In the earlier case, the post fault, post fault power angle curve was E e b sin delta x plus x dash, which is much lower. So, if I may say so, the decelerating area in this case is much larger than the earlier case. So, it appears that if you strengthen the transmission line say by decreasing the reactance, effective reactance of interconnection, then uh, it appears that you can improve transient stability. So, this is what I meant when I said you strengthen the transmission system, you make another transmission line or alternatively you can do another thing. You can take the same transmission system as before and compensate it by using series capacitors. This will reduce x. So, using series capacitors is another way in which you can enhance transient uh, stability. Okay. In fact, of course, one interesting point is that if uh, having series capacitors can under certain circumstances destabilize torsional oscillations in a synchronous uh, turbine generator system. This was what we called sub synchronous resonance, not always sometimes it could happen. Okay. But anyway, here we are talking of a distinct application where we are using series capacitors uh, the uh, rather uh, uh, the series the use of the series capacitors is essentially to improve the transient stability of the system, okay. because the x is reduced. So, we are actually enhancing the power angle electrical power versus delta and therefore, uh, having a larger decelerating area and as per equal area criterion which can give the stability behavior of a simple system. By increasing this decelerating area, we are effectively ensuring that this area is greater than this area and therefore, for this disturbance the system will be stable. Okay. Let us look at the other uh, you know, way you can improve stability. That is more obvious. You reduce the, you know, uh, extent of the disturbance itself. So if your disturbance is cleared very fast, then 
you will find that instead of being cleared here, you are clearing it out here. So, this area reduces. So, you are clearing it earlier. Clearing I mean the fault is detected and the faulted element is removed before the variables deviate too much from the original equilibrium. Okay. So, if I if I am able to clear this fault a bit earlier, I ensure that this area is smaller and this area is larger. So, the system becomes more stable. Okay. So, improving the protection system that is uh, you know detecting the fa fault fast enough and tripping uh, tripping out uh, the opening the circuit breaker at two ends uh, of the faulted element would really if you do it fast enough one can uh, improve stability. Okay. But of course, there are limitations to how fast you can uh, do a detection of a fault. Actually, the problem is not so much about how fast you can detect a fault, but how fast you can detect it reliably. So, usually a relay will take about half a cycle to one cycle to reliably you know it reliably you know uh, detect that there is actually a fault taken you know you for example a, re a relay should not trigger on noise a noisy input okay so typically a relay would uh, a good relay would take a little bit of time and ensure that it does not trip out something on a false alarm so typically you know you can say the state of the art would be that at fault you know uh, uh, a fault on say an extra high voltage system would be detected in roughly you know between uh, it will take approximately a cycle to detect reliably you can you can be sure that there is a fault so a relay detects that there is a fault and not it's not a false alarm in about you know slightly less than one cycle to one cycle okay and then it gives a tripping command to a circuit breaker the circuit breaker opening time also uh, you know maybe a cycle or two okay so the state of this is the f you know the kind of uh, best case situation. So, in 3 or 4 cycles you can expect that the fault will be cleared under the best case scenario. Okay. So, there are limitations to how fast you can do equipment protection. It is already if you look at the state of the art in EHV systems you can clear out faults in 3 or 4 cycles. Okay. So, that is that is possible. Okay. So, there is there is a limitation on how much faster you can go. Uh, than this. In fact, if you try to make it faster, you may compromise in the sense that the you may have trippings due to false alarms, you know, due to noisy input, or uh, of, uh, you know that kind of things can occur. So you need to have a dependable kind of relaying system which does not trip on a false alarm. Right? It doesn't give a false alarm and trip trip out elements. Okay. So there is a limitation to how much you can design fast protection schemes. So this is essentially a design issue means you know you can't make protection faster than a certain you know uh, a certain time scale the other way you can actually improve stability which is of course not apparent directly apparent using equilaria criterion is try to make proper use of your equipment in the sense see for example uh, every synchronous machine has got an excitation system the excitation system uh, can you know is usually designed to have fairly large transient limits. I mean you can actually have very high ceiling voltages or limiting voltages in a uh, static excitation system. You can actually just for a few you know uh, just for a short time you can actually inject uh, uh, you know fairly large field voltage. Okay, uh, You can have a large voltage at the field applied at the field. Although typically under steady state conditions uh, under say full load conditions in a say a round rotor machine, you may have a field voltage typically operating at around 2.5 to 3 per unit, but during transients you can actually boost up the field voltage to around 6 or 7 per unit okay? plus or minus 6 per or 7 per unit. This, this kind of range is given so that you can actually ensure a quick response time of the excitation system. Remember the field winding is a relatively slow subsystem. Okay. So, if you want to get fast response you have to really push it hard and that is why you have got rather large ceiling voltages for short duration. Okay. You cannot of course, apply very large field voltages uh, like 6 or 7 per unit for a long time, but for a short while you can boost up the field voltage and boosting up the field voltages to some extent 
like boosting the internal voltage of a synchronous machine okay and that is seen to improve the transient stability of the system okay so a very prudent use of the transient uh, you know transient limits or the transient rating of the power system equipment seems to be a good idea another example of this is when you have got a synchronous grid which also has got an hvdc link embedded in it so if you got an hvdc link embedded in a synchronous grid it's a still a synchronous grid because you have got a parallel ac line connecting uh, the generators in the two at the two sides of the system the point is that in case for example you have got a disturbance say these are two ac lines you have got a fault on this line and this line gets cleared okay now there may be an issue of loss of synchronism so what normally is uh, one of the good ways of ensuring transient stability is to temporarily boost up the power in the dc link so you boost up the power in the dc link okay and that can decelerate the two uh, you know the angular deviation or the angular speed deviation between the two machines so if this this machine is accelerating and this machine is decelerating to transiently boost up the power in the hvdc link typically an hvdc link also allows you a transient overrating for a very short while say half a second or one second you can boost up the power to a fairly large value i mean for example in 1000 megawatt hvdc link you may be able to go for just a second or so to 1500 or so megawatts okay that really could help in this transient system you could transiently boost up the power and ensure that the deviation between the machines is not too large so most hvdc links would have this feature of boosting power transiently during disturbances okay so uh, this these are two examples in which you can prudently use the transient uh, capabilities of equipment controllable equipment to improve transient stability okay the third uh, way you can improve transient stability is through preventive control and emergency control preventive what do you mean by preventive control look look at this so if you've got a system we'll again use equal area criterion this is a pre fault system this is a par angle curve for the post fault system so this is pre fault this is post fault i'm sorry so a typical equal area analysis suppose yields you these areas okay and you find that this area is less than this area you may be unstable okay so this is an approximate equal area kind of analysis now so this is the system reactance x p is the pm is equal so electrical power output is equal to mechanical power output in steady state so pm is the steady state electrical power output of the generator okay now if pm is large you see for the given fault and clearing time this area is more than this area suppose this is the a typical or a, a particular scenario which is there okay now if if pm is not so large but i operate the generator at not at this pm but at pm dash which is less than pm i can actually come to a situation where this area is more than this area okay so if i am during actual system operation if the operator senses or try, uh, you know by doing simulation studies realizes that is current operating condition is such okay or the mechanical power output of the generators the load patterns etc are such that the system is transiently unstable for credible disturbances then one of the ways he can actually improve it in this particular situation single machine infinite bus situation he can reduce pm so instead of operating at this operating point initially you operate at this operating point okay if you operate at this operating point it's likely that the decelerating area will be more than the accelerating area and therefore you can have for the same disturbance better stability in fact you may not lose stability or you you may not lose synchronism for large disturbances if your initial operating power is lesser okay now in a multi machine system
you know suppose there is an initial power flow of 500 megawatt on both lines this is 1000 this is 3000 and this is the generation here is 4000 megawatts sorry 2000 megawatts here and 2000 megawatts here suppose there is a fault there is a line clearing for this clearing time suppose you see that the system is unstable then one way of improving stability is to decrease the initial power flow to this system. Okay. What it would mean of course, is to do some re generation scheduling, rescheduling. What you can do is instead of this being 2000, this being 2000, you can have this as 1500. So, you reduce this power output of this generator, increase the power output of this generator. Okay. Now, you have 250 megawatts flowing here and 250 megawatts flowing here and for this power flow scenario, it is possible okay, that you may be transiently stable for this particular disturbance. Okay. For a single machine infinite bus, this can be easily understood from this you know these accelerating and decelerating areas. For a multi machine system, it would mean that a power flow through an interface can be reduced if it is seen that this system tends to separate uh, across this interface. Okay. So, one of the ways of reducing transient instability is of course, trying to reduce power flow through interfaces. Okay. Of course, remember that whenever a system in a multi machine system, a system loses transient instability, it can lose it in many ways in the sense that you can have different combinations of machines forming groups and separating out against other groups of machines okay. and which group separates against which other group or which machines constitute a group depends on the disturbance. So, that is one interesting and complicated challenge in the tra assessing transient instability. Okay. But suppose I know that the system separates in such a way that this machine separates out from this machine. In a two machine system, there is no other way you can separate out. In that case, I know the interface you know between the you know the cut set you can say and you try to reduce the initial flow through the cut set you may improve stability. Okay. So, this is called preventive control wherein a system operator realizes that the system may not be stable for this particular disturbance and therefore, he in reduces the interface flow at interfaces which characterize the accelerating and decelerating machines for that particular disturbance. Okay. So, this is called preventive control, but remember like the augmentation of a transmission system or adding a series capacitor in a transmission system, this will have an economic um, you know uh, it will have an economic penalty in, in some sense in the sense that you are you can reduce or improve the transient stability in this case by rescheduling generation. Now, it may so occur that this may be a cheap generator and this may be a costly generator. So, by doing this you are incurring an economic penalty. Okay. So, improving transient stability is really going to require some amount of uh, you know uh, you know it will require us to spend a bit of money. Okay. So, if you want to be more secure you know you have to pay a bit of money that is the whole uh, problem with uh, transient stability in case you are unstable. The other way, you know, so in a actually, when I say an operator does this, he actually does it in the sense that uh, uh, he, while a system is operating, uh, he actually gets the data from various remote measurements, okay, and he tries to evaluate uh, the system state or the system operating condition every 10 seconds to 1 minute. Okay. Once he knows what the system the you know operating condition of the system is after all he is sitting at a control center, he is getting remote measurements from that he is inferring what is the operating condition, what are the flows, what are the phase angular differences for a particular operating condition. Now, once he gets this information, what he does is runs transient stability simulation programs or variations of equal area kind of analysis to find out whether the system will be stable or not for credible disturbances. And if he finds that 
the system is stable for credible disturbances according to the simulated response, he will flag the system state as being normal. But in case the system could go unstable if a credible disturbance were to occur, then he will flag the state as alert in the sense that the system is operating in an alert state and the system may lose instability if a credible disturbance were to occur at that operating condition. In such a case, he will flag the system as an alert system condition and thereafter he will try to reschedule the power flows so as to in reduce the interface power flows okay, uh, along certain interfaces which really characterize the separation of machines. Okay. For example, in a two machine system the interface the tie lines which connect the two machines really define the interface. Okay. So, he will try to reduce the power flow to the interface, but he will try to do it in such a way so that there is a minimum economic uh, penalty in the sense that you lose lesser money by rescheduling or uh, reducing cheaper power and increasing uh, uh, you know generation from costlier sources. Okay. Remember that uh, the interface across which machines accelerate or decelerate depends on the disturbance itself. Okay. So, uh, um, you know it would not be correct to say that he reduces the system operator, he or she would reduce the power flow through the interface. There are many possible interfaces and depending on the disturbance for which the system goes unstable, a particular interface power flow may be more critical and a system may a system operator may tweak around the load gen, load or even the mainly the generation schedule okay, so that the system interface power through, through those interfaces reduces and thereby transient stability improves for that particular disturbance possible disturbance. Okay. So, this is called preventive control. He may do it in an optimal way in the sense there may be many machines in one group, many other machines in the other group and he may tweak around the power flows or the power schedule in such a way that there is minimum economic penalty. Okay. So, that is called security constrained optimal power flow and he may be doing it every half an hour or so. Okay. And this is the way a system is operated securely and as a result of which it is quite rare in a synchronous grid that you have got this transient or large disturbance instability problem. Although disturbances are continually occurring in a day there may be one or two major faults in a transmission system as uh, in our country uh, in a big power system as in our country, but you rarely the lights are always on that means that the system is operating stably. Okay. So, uh, one of the uh, beauties or one of the important things about the system operation power system operation is that it needs continuous monitoring and evaluation and assessment of stability and system uh, operating changes will have to be made online in case the system operator senses that the system may go unstable for some credible disturbances. He senses it of course, not by actual sensing, but by simulating the system. So, therein we have, he uses some numerical integration program which integrates numerically integrates the power system dynamical equations. Okay. Another way of course, uh, this is of course, um, we can try to do improve stability is through emergency control. That is you uh, the emergency control also is called heroic action. Okay. You, have, uh, you kind of predict or sense that an actual disturbance has occurred and the system is going out of step in spite of preventive control. See of course, because of preventive control one does not expect that the system will go transiently unstable for a credible disturbance, but sometimes if there is a mistake or error uh, in our assessment because you have not uh, a disturbance much more uh, you know much larger in magnitude than has been anticipated in our simulations occurs. In that case, preventive control may not be adequate. Okay. The system operator would have sensed that the system could be go unstable for a certain disturbance and he does some preventive control, but that preventive control is not adequate. It is not adequately implemented say or the system as I said the system disturbance magnitude may be much more than what was considered in our simulation. Okay. In that case, a system may actually go unstable in spite of all these precautions which were taken. Okay. 
in such a situation as the system is going unstable, can we trigger certain control actions and get back the system and ensure that it does not go unstable. This kind of thing is conceivable, but not easy. So, there are two possibilities that because of inadequate preventive control or uh, inability to anticipate a very large disturbance which actually occurs eventually, you may actually go out of step. In that case, you are going out of step as the system is evolving, you have to predict that you are going out of synchronism and if you are going out of synchronism, you trigger control actions like generation load tripping or use specialized devices like dynamic brakes. I will not describe to you today what a dynamic brake is. You can do a search, a literature survey on this and see what a dynamic brake is. It is a device to improve stability. So, you, you see that the system is going out of synchronism. So, you quickly take some actions and prevent the system going out of synchronism or allow graceful system separation, you know allow islanding. But the thing is you allow you do not allow uncontrolled system separation. What you do is you try to form islands you know which are controlled island formation. You trip out certain lines and form islands so that there is good load generation balance in that area okay, the island. So, that there is a greater possibility that the island survives. Okay. So, both these possibilities exist. In this in the latter possibility you are allowing loss of synchronism, but you are separating out the areas okay, and you are forming the areas based on some previous study which you have done okay, that there is better load generation balance in this area. So, let us form an island consisting of these generators and these loads with the knowledge that the system is going out of synchronism. Okay. But of course, it would be nice if the system did not go out of synchronism at all because that would involve no generation or load trippings. Okay. But the problem is how do you predict out of step operation in real time okay. and how do you determine the quantum of control actions. In case you are going for separation of the system, then how do you do the have a good adaptive choice of separation points. So, these are the kind of problems which may come up in emergency control. Remember that the time window in which you have in order to act is quite small just a few seconds you know one or two seconds you have to act and do this thing before otherwise you may not be left with uh, you, you may be having unviable islands in which frequency collapses or rises beyond 51 or 52 hertz and that causes a complete blackout. Okay. So, we have do not have much of time to really do this, okay. but uh, one can conceive and one can try to do the best under the circumstances. And people have in fact, uh, if you look at this particular example, just to show you that just by looking at the rotor angles for a short while, you may not be able to tell what happens after some time. So, prediction is a very difficult problem. Okay. This, particularly, this particular example shows a system simulation in which the system breaks into three groups of machines. Okay. This can occur also. Okay. So, it really shows you that predicting instability is quite a tough problem. Just from available measurements to predict whether this how the system is going to behave in real time is really going to be tough. In fact, faster than real time, you have to make a prediction and then take some control action. So, this kind of problem is a very, very tough problem and robustness of emergency controls will always be a very big issue. Okay. But nonetheless, such kind of emergency control schemes have been conceived. In fact, you have got uh, you know several in the world in uh, such kind of heroic actions in which you determine some kind of signatures of transient instability and then take some control actions to prevent instability. Okay. So, that kind of thing is conceivable, but robustness will always be an issue under such circumstances. So, with this uh, uh, we kind of close our course uh, and we have really discussed in this particular lecture ways of improving stability. Okay. If you just recap what we have done in this course, we started off with the analysis, the general analysis techniques and then we spent quite a bit of time in modeling of uh, synchronous machines and some other elements. Thereafter, we did using simple systems, small signal analysis, uh, numerical simulation and try to I try to show you 
some of the phenomena, stability phenomena which can be analyzed. Okay. In fact, uh, one of the quotes of Einstein which, uh, uh, which I did mention in the first lecture was that the most incomprehensible thing about uh, this universe is that it is comprehensible. In some ways, uh, you can even apply this to a power system. Uh, of course, a power system is a part of the universe. So, obviously, this quote applies to it also, but what I mean to say is that by systematic analysis uh, and use of analytical tools, all these phenomena can actually be predicted. Okay? All using synchronous machine model, all the systematic modeling uh, uh, techniques and analysis techniques can allow you to analyze these kind of phenomena. And of course, if you can analyze the phenomena, you can often uh, find out or predict or design ways of improving stability. Okay. So, in fact, uh, I did show you some real life uh, disturbance plots etcetera in this course and uh, all the stability, most of the stability phenomena which uh, you know which we discussed in this course, in fact all of them have actually been observed in practice and analyzed also okay, and replicated using these analysis tools. Okay. So, uh, this is what I would like you to take back. Uh, with you after doing this course. Okay. There are a lot of things which we could not cover like uh, you know we could not cover in detail how to make large scale power system analysis programs okay, or large scale eigen analysis programs, okay, small signal stability programs, but with the tools which you have learnt in this particular course and the models which you have learnt and the case studies which you have done uh, in this course, I hope uh, it will be a good uh, starting point to actually take on these studies, although we could not cover it in this particular course. So, with that um, uh, we, uh, we end this course and I hope you enjoyed it.